Are you ready to rewind? Take a nostalgia filled ride back to a simpler time. It's Acid Wash Memories, a retro pop culture celebration. And now, your hosts, Joe Morata and Michael Quinn. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 64 of Acid Wash Memories, a retro pop culture celebration. Today, we're talking about Seinfeld. I am Joe Morata, alongside our very own Art Vandalay, Michael Quinn. How you doing there, Michael? Howdy-ho. Always wanted to be an architect, didn't yes, you? Yes, every... That <laughs> was that was definitely my dream, and George Costanza gave me that dream. Of course he did. And folks, thank you for uh, waking up from your dreams to listen to us here. We hope it doesn't turn out to be a nightmare for you as we get into Seinfeld, the first of a mini-series that we're going to do here, a three-parter that'll be scattered about the next this several episodes. This too, like, involved... This is a lot. There is a lot. I I totally agree with you. What's the show about? It's about nothing. Folks, if this happens to be your first time, we are a retro pop culture celebration, and we do have 63 other episodes available. Where, Michael Quinn? In the archives. In the archives. So you can find something you like. Perhaps you're not a Seinfeld fan, which uh, we're not here to change your mind, but we're kind of here to change your mind if you're not. (laughs) This is one of those shows where, like, I feel like, yeah, there's people that aren't fans, but it's very few. It's like I one of the most true. popular shows like ever, ever. ever and the people literally. that aren't fans are like very loud and proud about how like that show sucked and that's it's true. overrated and blah blah blah. And you're allowed to have those opinions. We're not going to argue, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can do this. You can follow us on Twitter at AWM Podcast, and you can also join our Facebook group. We do have one there, and people are actually nice to each other on this group. Yeah, they don't say Seinfeld stunk, and, and they I'm, might. I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's going to be an actual Seinfeld stunk. I'm, I'm good. good. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. But if you want to, uh, whether you like Seinfeld or not, if you want to talk about old crap with a bunch of other people, join our Facebook group. It's called. Acid Wash Memories. Very imaginative name. It's so... Uh, on Facebook. We thought a lot for a while about that one. We really did. But I've been thinking a lot uh, about this for a while. It was inevitable that we would talk about Seinfeld. And again, just to recapitulate this, we're doing this in a three-parter for several reasons. A, I think it needs that amount of time. Yeah. Because it's a very dense program. It really is. There's a lot that goes there's on like in this show. There's like eras. And, there's, and that's the other thing. Yeah, there's like different aspects to it. <laughs> and because there were nine seasons, in a bit of serendipity, it splits up nicely that the first three are kind of the low-key, getting our feet wet with the show. The first ones, I feel, are like, they're trying to prop this up as a typical sitcom when it isn't. <laughs> there is a bit of an air at times yeah. with that. The middle portion, which we'll be doing in part two, which is not next week, not next week, Mm -hmm. it'll be a different time. That is the heart of the show. A lot of people's favorites. And then seven to nine, especially eight and nine, is where we get really wacky, uh, which is a lot of people love the end of the show, too. Yeah. This is the set from the old Murph Griffin show. And that's what I always think is funny about the, the last seasons is that their wackiness makes it for like unevenness but at the same time some of the best episodes yes. because they're just so insane I do agree like that that's the thing it's like a scattered amongst the last seasons is some of the best episodes there ever was I agree with you right which is weird it is weird because it's atypical for a sitcom but Seinfeld in itself is an atypical show and right we're gonna talk about today in part one the history and how we got to Seinfeld and then we're gonna run through uh seasons one through three mm, giddy up So Seinfeld, in case you have never seen it, uh, well, you might want to know this. It is known uh, both critically and consumer wise, you know, on a fan level as one of the greatest sitcoms of all time. It really is known as that. It was influential in a way that maybe is lost on people that didn't grow up during it because a lot of the things that it did are commonplace now in sitcoms. Like, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is a good example. Right. But there's many others of these unlikable characters. They're termed unlikable very often. They're likable because they're unlikable. It's it's a very subversive show as far as like the landscape that came before it, that it's like intentionally trying to be like, we're not that. The anti-sitcom in a right. lot of ways. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Look at all the junk that's on TV. It was critically acclaimed for almost the duration, if not all of its run. A lot of people pick Seinfeld as their favorite sitcom. Quinn, I'm going to ask you point blank. Is this your favorite show? You know, a couple years ago, I might have said yes, but I'm not. It's a very like, it's a touchy thing, right? It's like, I I know that probably on a critical level, it's the best, 
But uh, sometimes I just, I'm kind of like, I'm not in the mood for it all the time. So I can't say it's like the greatest thing ever. Is it up to there me. for you though? Oh yeah. It's yeah. like definitely like top three, that up there. I would say if I had to pick, it probably is my personal favorite mm-hmm. sitcom of all time. It, I think it is. I can't think of one that I like more, except maybe some of the prime Roseanne. Roseanne. Um, in terms of sitcoms. Yeah, I mean, there's other stuff. Even what's funny is like even shows much later came along that were you know pretty freaking good, like um, like Shit's Creek or something like that. Sure, it's not like stuff hasn't come along of its caliber post Seinfeld. Sure, it's just kind of like it has this like the precursor. It's kind of the it set the stage for like the modern sitcom. It did though. It did break new ground, and that yeah. sometimes again gets lost with people much younger than us that are watching. And they're like, this isn't funny. <laughs> funny <laughs> there's nothing funny about that the one thing is it it isn't is not funny it's yeah, funny it's a it, very it, funny like, show it, it's one of those shows that it, it's kind of like the simpsons and it's prime where it's like it's just a laugh every two seconds yeah. about a different thing right yeah. it's because because it, i mean there are some episodes again even in the later seasons where it's it, it's just thing after thing after thing and some of it's like iconic or you know as nowadays they would say meme worthy it's like very like the, these are just things you just remember because they were just so off the freaking wall it really did have the proper combination of casting and script writing it yeah really did I, one of one of the you know one of the defining features of seinfeld to me that really sets it apart is that sometimes people will say remember the episode when this happened but then somebody will say, remember the episode when this happened? And then they'll both realize, wait, those were the same episodes. Like, that's like how much like stuff happens. crazy, yeah. like super memorable can, stuff can even happen in one episode to the point of like people don't even remember they're in the same episode. Yeah. Some of the plots are so like completely different for Divergent. all the char- characters in one episode. You're right? absolutely right. And it really did shape humor for uh, for a lot of it shaped my sense of humor. In a lot of ways, it really did. I'm not joking. And around. I think it's it, it, because it covers a lot of things. It's like it does work humor. It does like life humor, like ca- like just the mundane. Casual, the mundane, touching on like weird stuff, like the Bubble Boy, right? And like in it, like weird. it does obscure stuff. Like yeah. they make references that again, that's common to do now, right? But they would do these like highbrow references to things that most of the audience didn't get, like weird stuff where Jerry would like ponder. Bizarro Superman, like right. like as if anybody gave a shit. But exactly, like, you know what I mean. Like nobody did give a shit. But yeah, they do it in a funny way, so it works. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of times it was above the head of its audience, right? Which is like a no no. You're not supposed to do that, right? You're not supposed to go above everyone. You're supposed to appeal to you know the Midwest. You're supposed. I'm not. No offense, but you're supposed to appeal to the com- appeal to the commoner. Well, at some point the show, I th- feel it became very New York centric to. The- I- Point I think of like, it always was like stuff about Steinbrenner was like that was like known to the New York crowd, especially around here. Well, so it true. felt like it was a show because his just eccentricities like were just kind of like public knowledge. <laughs> when, when Frank <laughs> Stanza was like, "Why'd you trade Jay Buner?" Yeah, like, nobody yeah. really knows about that, you right? Know what I mean? But but <laughs> you know, if you're around here, I guess it really did appeal to it us because yeah. we were just like, "This guy's so weird. It's weird that he owns a baseball team. Like, who is this man?" Very eccentric yeah. fellow. Everybody out. I got a plan on my mind. Costanza, go get me a couple of calzones right now. And yet some people hate this show. And again, if we change your mind, great. If we don't uh, and you're still listening, well, that's good. We appreciate that. Seinfeld is often said, Quinn, to be a show about nothing, but that's really just their in-joke from the show. It's not really about nothing. Yeah, and honestly, that comes from a, a, a Seinfeld plot when they were writing a script for a whole season. A whole meta story arc they were right, doing. Which was, it's like I guess, about like is it taking little anecdotes from when they were pitching the show in the first place exactly. which again is like comp- really meta in the first place like yeah. m- that's meta in and of itself right which was kind of cool at the time yeah. well it's, it's not about nothing no it's about nothing in my opinion seinfeld is about four people who are generally generally self-centered i and wouldn't it, say they're bad people they're, they're self-centered they're, they're self-centered they're egotistical maybe or whatever yeah it's sometimes a comedy of errors. Sometimes it's ironic. But it's also a meta commentary, too, about the fact that, like, a lot of people are self-centered. Like That's it's, the whole it's thing. It's not like we're some, the, we're, like, noble people in the audience, like, watching them. They're pretty much, like, normal. Normal. Yeah. It's like, they, they react to a, to a lot of stuff 
the way normal people would, like very indifferent to a lot of things. But the reason why that works is because in that time in a sitcom, the characters would always react very nobly to certain right. situations. Whereas in Seinfeld, like if they see a homeless guy, they don't even give a shit. Except maybe Kramer. Yeah. Kramer would. Right. But like that, that's that kind of like that commentary on like, this is how people really this is act. How people really and are. There's a weird dark comedy to that. A lot of the show also, especially in the earlier years, touches on the ambiguity of like social norms. Yeah. Like social customs, you know, yes. like and and Jerry and Larry's antithope to, you know, why do we have to bring something to a dinner party? Why yeah. do you have to kiss someone hello? You know, like weird stuff. Yeah, like, like the that. whole Bobka episode where right, they, they right. don't even want to be doing that. Like that that's yes. like part of part of the episode is in fact, most of the episode is getting the bopka just to go yes, to some and the wine, just to go to some fucking dinner party. They don't they, they a, don't want to go a, to. They don't want to go to be they're questioning why they need to bring this in the first place yeah. the whole time. Right. These people invited us for dinner. We have to bring something. Why? <laughs> because it's rude. Otherwise. And a lot of the show touches upon things like that and and wanting moral justice, wanting to just get the win, so to right, speak, yeah. in a situation that doesn't matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? Judge Stahl would have smoked that guy! Sometimes it's just centered on petty revenge and, and things like that. Pure slapstick comes into play. And I think in this series, as we lay out the various seasons and eras and the characters, hopefully we can shine a light on the why of why this show was so different compared to what was on TV at the right. time when it came to play, right? And hopefully we'll show that despite the fact that, like we said, the four main characters are always considered, like, awful, they're not really bad people. They do have a moral compass. I always thought that a lot of that was because the way the show went out, the famous last episode, yeah, yeah. is portraying them like they're the worst people in the ever or but something really not like but th to be honest it's a commentary on how like everyone acts like that and it's humorous that they're being judged in a court of law for acting like normal people it is that's though. like and that's it's almost like a sad commentary it is ironic what's ironic this that we've come all this way we made all this progress but you know we lost the little things the niceties no i i mean what does ironic mean some of the people they deal with are much more antagonistic and worse than they are. Yeah, but at the end of the day, nobody's like evil or anything. It's not like some, no, <laughs> some it's comic just rude, book or anything. Rude, yeah, yeah, maybe, they're, right? They're just irritating. <laughs> right, yeah. right. They're annoying. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about the show here. We do have some ground to cover. So obviously, you can't talk about Seinfeld without talking about Jerry Seinfeld, right. the comedian. Do whatever the hell you got to do. I don't know. <laughs> so he was born in 1954 mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. He became a stand-up in 1976, so that's a young age. And I actually pulled here, I brought a reel of his earliest filmed appearance from 1977. Look no, I know, he's got the glasses <laughs> Well, welcome and to the old days where everyone looked like... They're, I'm like, I'm 19, but you look like you're 36. He's like, like it's just, 15 years younger than we are here, yeah. and you would, he looks like an accountant. Yeah. You know? Here's Jerry in 1977. Manhattan is where I live. Manhattan, as you know, is the site of the tramway. The tramway is this new thing that they have on Roosevelt Island. It's a cable car that goes back and forth between Manhattan the accent, and Roosevelt Island. Yeah, the I much think thicker. that this is a terrific thing. The city's on the verge of bankruptcy. They're putting up rides for us. And <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was a very funny clip. They're putting up rides yeah. for us. I, that's a very Jerry outlook on very things. Very Jerry. Now, Jerry uh, Seinfeld came up in the comedy club scene, like a lot of the classics did in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> This is what makes also the, calling the show Seinfeld. It's almost by the 90s. It's like passe that, that the show is originally like a weird vehicle for a stand up comedian. Yeah, because everyone like, that, was doing by that. By 98, when the show ended, that was like not really a thing that was done anymore. Right. He like <laughs> he started when he started doing the show. That was like very common. Yeah. And by the time Seinfeld ended, they really weren't doing that anymore. Yeah, yeah right. it really wasn't that like we're going to name the show after the comedian like and the, stuff. Like <laughs> the Cosby show. Yeah, and like the Drew Carey by, by show. The, by 98, it's like... Roseanne. It's totally different. Like, Caroline in the City. Right. Which is like, Dharma and Greg. <laughs> yeah, it's like totally not that. Friends. Friends, yeah. exactly. Now, uh, Seinfeld, it, maybe this is obvious, he wasn't the first comedian to do the observational humor. Just mm -hmm. to be clear, David Brenner was one, but you know who another one was that did, like, everyday annoyances? 
Jay Leno. Yeah. A comedian. Like even Johnny comedian. Carson would make jokes about like Central Park or something. Right. Like, you know, like it's not this wasn't like uncommon. He was just very good at it. Jerry he was just Sun. very good at it. That's one of the things. I don't I, I like Jerry's stand up. I do find it funny. Mm-hmm. But Jerry's never been for me as a stand up. Never like a number one or anything. He's never been yeah, right. Like like Chris Rock was a laugh out loud. Yeah. Carlin like prime Carlin is yeah, a laugh yeah, out yeah. loud, you know? Seinfeld was always like, he'll make you chuckle, though. Weirdly, the sitcom was the perfect place for Jerry because he was such a strong observational humorist. Like, it works better when it's illustrating him in the actual situation, yes. reacting to it. Like, that's funnier than him describing the situation to you on a stage. He's a great reactor. Right. With, like, a very, like, his sarcastic quips to things are, are his hallmark in my right. opinion. And he's kind of weirdly the straight man of the show, which is what's Even so though funny. He's f- the comedian, right? Right. Like he, like the whole and the, they, they almost like a joke about that, right? That he's a comedian, but like he's, of all of them, he's the least like of a character. Uh, would you say? Absolutely. Like, oh, 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 the rest of them are like insane. Now Seinfeld did dip his toe very briefly into acting. He uh, had a short recurring role on a comedy known as Benson in 1980, he was Frankie the Delivery Boy, what? <laughs> and what? And in typical like stand up, let's get a stand up on a sitcom. The whole deal was that he kept trying to do stand up routines that nobody wanted to hear. This is stupid. And he didn't like it. Yeah, I, I I'm glad he didn't do that. Give a cheer, Frankie's here. Frankie, what do you want? <laughs> I brought a letter over from Miss Krause, and I thought since I was here, I'd... you'd pitch a few jokes to the governor. Frankie, sit down. <laughs> but ben- sit, 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 sit. <laughs> Frankie, let me tell you something. I like you. Now, that may come as a surprise to you. I know it does to me. You're a good messenger and a nice kid. I like everything about you except your jokes. But they're funny. They're not funny, Frankie. He did land on Carson. You mentioned Carson. May of 81 was his first appearance on The Tonight Show. There's even Seinfeld episodes about him being on The Tonight Show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's on on Seinfeld. Appearing on Johnny Carson Mm -hmm. could be... Like a make or break for a stand up comedian back in the 80s. Well, 90s all the way back, right? Like, right. Especially in the 80s. If you do well on Carson, he's going to invite you back and people are going to know who you are because everybody friggin' watched yeah. The Tonight Show, right? Mm-hmm. Weather reports are the same wherever you go in the country. They always have the guy who comes out, he shows you the highs, the lows, the fronts. Then they show you the satellite photo. This is real helpful. A photograph of the Earth from 10,000 miles away. Can you tell if you should take a sweater or not from that shot? So Seinfeld did well in May of 81, and he did keep coming back. This led eventually to a modicum of fame where he had an HBO special in September of 87, mark that, known as Stand Up Confidential. Now, I've seen this special. It's very Seinfeld. Look at your lives. (laughs) This is your life. You're right in the middle of it right now. You're not home. That's about it. So far, that's all you've accomplished. Now, Jerry Seinfeld was managed by uh, George Shapiro and Howard West, and it doesn't, well, you don't need to know who they are, but they wrote a letter being show business managers to Brandon Tartikoff, who we talked about recently yes. on Must See TV, in 1988. Okay, so the HBO special has been out. George Shapiro said, you know, call me crazy, but I think Jerry will be doing a show for NBC one day. I said, dear Brandon, call me a crazy guy, but I think uh, Jerry Seinfeld will soon be on NBC. This led to a meeting between Jerry Seinfeld and NBC in 1988. And Rick Ludwin, who's a name that is important to the story, he was NBC's vice president of late night programming and specials. He was like, well, Jerry, what do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to do right. a sitcom? Do you, you want like a Bob Hope style special, you know, like an occasional thing? <laughs> I know, man, wild. Um, and Jerry's idea, Jerry Seinfeld's idea was, why don't we do a, um, a 90 minute special where we get a camera, it follows me around, I will see what's going on around me in New York or LA, maybe it was LA, and that will be the impetus for me gathering material and at the end of the special, I'll perform It'll the material. Be a show. Right. Which okay. is kind of an episode of Seinfeld. If it you is. think about it, except right. reverse, because he would do the stand up at the, the beginning. beginning. And right. sometimes, sometimes like inter. Later on. Like, yeah. I mean, they, earlier on. Yeah. yeah. Like throughout the show, it'd be sprinkled in. But yeah, it's kind of the same thing. 
So Warren Littlefield, who we also talked about, he was like the number two at the time mm-hmm. to Brandon Tartikoff. He was like, well, okay, who are you going to have work with you on this? You know, you need a, a showrunner. You need a writer. You need an experienced person. And Jerry's like, well, Larry David. And they're like, who? <laughs> I mean, Larry David, it's not like he'd done nothing by this point. Well, here's what... Uh, anyway, he worked for NBC. Here's what Larry David had done. You're right. <laughs> but he was very minor, yeah. right? So Larry David, who obviously, those of you that like Curb, you yeah. know who he is. He was born uh, a little bit before Jerry in 1947, also from Brooklyn. He had been a stand-up comedian in the 70s in New York, and he moved out to L.A. in 79, and then became a writer for... A show that was called Fridays on ABC from 80 to 82. Fridays is the show. Maybe some of you have heard this were like, um, wasn't this their fake SNL? Yeah, like, <laughs> it was. It's exactly what it was. It's mad TV before mad TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Friday Fights. I'm Dan Butterworth here with Betsy Grayson in the kitchen of a relatively new duplex. This is the show where Andy Kaufman did a guest appearance on it, but he like intentionally like wasn't reading his lines correctly and... <sighs> It was yeah. a whole incident. I don't. I can't play stoned. <laughs> <laughs> so eighty to eighty-two, and then he parlayed that into the real deal for one season, eighty-four, eighty-five season. He was a writer for Saturday Night Live. The SNL thing. That's like his big claim to fame that by was this the point. One thing. Yeah, like it's a ho ho SNL. It's it's sort of funny. NBC's like who who like it's like worked well, for them. Warren Littlefield probably didn't know that. Yeah, because there's some some writer. Yeah. it wasn't like he mattered. Uh-huh. To be fair, those of you that might know this about SNL between eighty to eighty five. It stunk. There were <laughs> there were some problems I, <laughs> other than like Eddie Murphy, literally, and then. Some people give like Joe Piscopo some credit because he, yeah, yeah. he did the try. Yeah, but yeah. Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Nobody remembers Joe Piscopo anymore. It's sad, isn't it? He really just like once <laughs> once says that he was out SNL. Nobody gave a shit. They're like, like who? Yeah, he became like a punchline. Yeah, but anyway, Larry David got one sketch on the air in the death slot, like the twelve fifty five. Those slot. are all the best sketches. I know, me. but nobody watches. Yeah. A side note: I am a huge, big proponent of like garbage time on this SNL. Is true. I, I think the best shit comes out of it usually. Like, it, not kidding. It, it's always like the best stuff on the show. It's always the weirdest, dumbest shit. All the executives hate garbage time i think it's like the best like it's the funniest you can do whatever you want right so after this larry david went back to stand up he was about three minutes up there he wasn't really getting too many laughs and he goes i don't need this forget it he threw the microphone down called the audience a bunch of ignorant <laughs> and and walked <laughs> off the stage he said F- you he said F- you people and he left the stage i went wow what an act but he had known Jerry Seinfeld, and they were friends uh, because comedians tend to stick together. And for whatever reason, I guess Jerry thought of Larry as you know a real writer because he had been a writer for Fridays and SNL. So he's like, well, I'll have him develop this with me. He's got a very similar comic sensibility to me. So they decide, Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David, that 90 minutes is too long. How are we going to do this for 90 minutes? Why don't we instead just try to do some kind of half-hour pilot concept, right? Okay. And the idea was, let's mix traditional stand-up with some sitcom-style stuff. And obviously, at this point, they realized, well, if we're going to do that, we need more people. It's not just Jerry, right? right? We need someone for him to talk to and all that. So NBC just suggests that Jerry and Larry get with Castle Rock Entertainment as their production company. Now, Which, I, if you're a Seinfeld watcher, yeah. like at the end of every <laughs> yep. episode, da, 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 da. the White House and yeah. At the helm of Castle Rock Entertainment was the meathead Quinn, Rob Reiner. Yeah. Who at that point was a very acclaimed director. He had done Spinal Tap. He had done yeah. Stand By Me. He I was mean, about to this, do Harry Met Sally. Yeah, by this point, Rob Reiner had a resume. Oh, hell yeah, he I did. wouldn't say he was in the super, like... Nowadays, Rob Reiner's in the like rarefied air, like legendary status. Yeah, but not yet. Not during this time. He was just kind of like he's pretty good, like that kind of like, <laughs> right? Like up and coming. Even yeah. though he was like forty something. But because it, you know he had like an acting career before, so like it's like a second career. Yeah, and he's only in like the first ten ish years he, of it. He pulled like the Ron Howard. Yeah, you know where the yeah where he cur- just completely changed. Yeah, exactly. And Rob Reiner's all in on the idea now. His dad, Carl Reiner, had known Jerry. Mm -hmm. liked Jerry Seinfeld, okay? 
So uh, the executives from both NBC and Castle Rock, they have their own ideas about what this show should be. And Larry David, who is somewhat of a mercurial, volatile person, he's like, I'm not doing anything that you want, basically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, for one, am not going to compromise my artistic integrity. And I'll tell you something else. This is the show, and we're not going to change it. It's Larry. <laughs> like, from the get-go, he's That's like, fucking Larry. We're doing the show the way we want to do the show. Like, I know Curb is, like, an exaggeration, but yes. at the same time, there's a lot of, like... Truth. From what I've read about him, there's a lot of truth to a lot of the shit on that show. Like, he is very, like, I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to do this my way. And that's basically what it was, right? But anyway, NBC greenlights a pilot. So we're going to do a 30-minute sitcom stand-up hybrid pilot, okay? Mm -hmm. Which means we need a casting session. So what they decided was, well, this guy that Jerry talks to, his best friend on the show, is going to be based on Larry. <laughs> now, I mean, yeah. Now, I, if you know anything about who this is, this, I'm just going to say, George Costanza yeah. is Larry David. It's, George it's Costanza. like so obvious in retrospect, especially after like Curb came about. Yeah. They're the same person. It's an avatar for Larry David. Yeah. Now, people have often wondered, why didn't Larry play George? And you know what the reason is? He didn't want to. Yeah, like, and then he had to be the man in the cape anyway, so right. <laughs> there's more important reasons. <laughs> he was the man in the cape. People have uh, often asked me, uh, how come you didn't play George? Didn't you want to play George? And the answer to that is, is no. I had, n there was never a notion that I wanted to do this. He's talked about it like he didn't wa he wasn't an actor. He didn't yeah. want to play George. He wanted to write it. Yeah. And he basically said all I wanted to fucking do was write the pilot, get the I think it was twenty five thousand dollars for doing it and go back to L.A. and that or New York, whatever. <laughs> and that was it. Like he wasn't he didn't want to be an actor. Right. You know, <laughs> so in case anyone's wondering why wasn't Larry David George like, oh, he missed out. He didn't want to. He had no desire. He had no desire to Again, play George. Very Larry David. Right. <laughs> Plus, NBC wanted a real actor. They wanted like somebody that because Jerry's not. Yeah. So George Lewis Costanza, who was named after a real life childhood friend of Jerry, known as Mike Costanza, in the initial pilot draft that Larry and, and Jerry did, George was also a comedian, and his name was Bennett. <laughs> what? They quickly changed that to George being a real estate agent right and being named George in the show they've known each other since school so they're like very right. close they friends to like camp together yeah, and they, like, went, they, they have all right. these like weird memories yep so a bunch of people auditioned for this role including Nathan Lane whoa David Allen Greer Brad Hall weird who, I can see Nathan Lane in this role he could have been a he George. could have absolutely done this he could role. have done the George and uh, Larry Miller, and if you don't, if that name doesn't ring a bell, he was a stand-up, but if you remember the Seinfeld episode, The Doorman, where there's like this very volatile doorman that Jerry is dealing mm -hmm. with, that's Larry Miller. Gotcha. Jerry's friend. But anyway, on April 3rd, 1989, that is one day after WrestleMania 5. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jason Alexander auditioned on tape for the role of George Cassandra. so That was pretty common back then, though. The tape. It was. Yeah. So Jason Alexander's real name, by the way, is J. Scott Greenspan. Really? Yes. And I he, didn't know that. Do you know where he grew up? Where? Maplewood, New Jersey. Yeah, he looks like right a Jersey down the road, guy. He's a Jersey guy. And some of you know this. Jason Alexander was more of a theater guy. Yes. He wasn't like, I want to be an actor on sitcoms. No, like he, no, no, no. <laughs> like, and you, you could tell from his later work from once he had money and he could do what he wanted, he yeah. went right back to like more theater shit. Dramatic roles. Yeah. Like he, very good actor. Yeah. By the way. Like a legitimate, he's also in Shallow Howl. Remember? Yeah. He has. He has. A tail. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he, he can do a lot of stuff, but like he's an actor, actor. He's, he's not, not a like stand up. A, he's not a comedian or anything. No, he could do the comedic lines. Yeah. But he's not a comedian. Yeah. He, he's an actor, like a real actor, right? Right. He actually weirdly gives the show some like acting credentials. Exactly. You know? And that's why, like, of course, they weren't going to. NBC wouldn't let Larry David do this role, even if he right. wanted to. <laughs> and I'm sure NBC would have demanded that some, somebody on the cast actually knows how to freaking act. Right. Right. You know? And he did. He was yeah. a Broadway actor. Uh, he had won a Tony in 1989 for uh, Jerome Robbins' Broadway. A Tony? Yeah. 
That's important. Yeah, but this is always a trend: is to have a have some kind of reputable actor. Absolutely, it doesn't need to be like the most. I, I mean, reputable in the sense among other actors, yes. like an actual like an actor's actor, uh, an actor's actor. Yeah, Jason Alexander uh, was a very good one. Jerry knew who he was. Now, Jason had dabbled in TV. Some of you might have seen some of his commercials, the Mick DLT commercial where yeah, he's like he was singing. in commercials and stuff. He I was. remember that. He yeah. was. Got to make a buck. Hey, you say you're getting tired of lettuce and tomato hamburgers in this town that don't quite make it? Yeah! He was in a show known as ER, but not that ER. The other ER. The sitcom one. And you know who else was in that? George Clooney. Like, somehow. Why is he always a doctor? Like, what is that? Or Booker. Or like a lawyer or something. <laughs> he's like, serious. Yeah. You know who else is in it? Elliot Gould. Oh, yeah, there you go. From Schitt's Creek. Jason Alexander starred in a failed sitcom that was on for a season known as Everything's Relative in 1987. Here's a little uh, <laughs> little snippet for you. Of all the new test products that you have ever brought home from the office, this new toothpaste rich for is these the people. Worst. Look at their house. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's not a toothpaste. <laughs> it's a uh, shaving paste. New concept. He delivers. Ju- he delivers just like George. I mean, he like, does he, have that mode. Yeah. yeah. He's also got hair in that clip, which is off-putting to me. I think it's fake. Yeah. Uh, for the record, Jason Alexander as George Costanza was only 29 when the pilot was filmed. That makes sense. He doesn't look it though. <laughs> Honestly, he's he's got a baby face though in, he in that last scene. Like, he, does. he does. He does. And George always did have a baby. That's what was always a very weird look about George is he has a baby face, but he has old man hair and the glasses it, too. Yeah, it's very like weird. It is right. It is. So they also decided, you know what? Let's let's have a neighbor. Now in real life, when Larry David lived in a, a housing complex in Hell's Kitchen, yeah. In New York. I know this character's I know this character's based off someone because they've said it and also he just seems like somebody you would meet right. in New York City, like a complete scene. So across the hall from Larry David was a man by the name of Kenny Kramer. And we started hanging out and we became very good friends. I mean best friends. It's you know, and it's unlikely for us two guys to be such good friends because we're very different kinds of people. I'm an outgoing, fun loving, ready to party kind of guy. And you know, this is George Costanza. Now, Kenny Kramer was a, a gentleman of no fixed ability. He kind of just, like, made money somehow. Nobody yeah. really knew. And this, 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 all this shit was worked into Kramer. Like, nobody can understand how he has an apartment in right. New York. Like, where well, he hasn't had... He's been on strike or whatever. Yeah. Or, and, and they, remember when they elaborate on Kramer's backstory being on in, strike in from the, the bagel shop in for, the last like, season, 20 by the way. years or something? In your favorite season. Yeah. <laughs> And Kenny Kramer was a friend of Larry David. He would wander into his apartment. He would eat his food. Like, Mm -hmm. this is all real. I've met the real Kenny Kramer. Oh, have you? I've been to his apartment. (laughs) What does it look like? Wasn't that impressive? Yeah, I I shouldn't be. (laughs) My friend uh, whose uncle worked in Hollywood, uh, Jim Valley, who went on to do Arrested Development. Yeah. He was a friend of Kenny Kramer. So he called up Kramer. And he's like, hey, I'm here with my nephew and his friend. Can we come to your apartment? I don't so, know if I'd want to meet this man based off Larry He was <laughs> very just, nice. Based off Larry Davis' description of him. Very, very I mean, nice he's almost man. scary. No, he was nice. And he had a big bowl of junior mints on his coffee table. <laughs> yep, that's... Because he, knew, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Remember he did the Kramer reality tour? Yep. Like, later? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, Larry David's like, we got to make a character based on, this, on Kramer. <laughs> and Jerry was like, you know if we do this, the real... Kenny Kramer is going to want a piece of it. Yeah. He's going to horn in. And guess what? Kenny Kramer's like, the only way you can do this is if I get to play Kramer. And they're like, you're not an actor. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. You can do it on one condition. Whatever you want. I get to play Kramer. You can't play Kramer. I am Kramer. But you can't act. So Jerry's like, if we call him Kramer, you know that he's going to contact NBC. Mm-hmm. He's going to make a list of demands. Let's call him something else. So they call him Kessler, only in the one pilot. This obviously <laughs> gets changed to Kramer. Now, Kramer, the character, is written without a first name, first of all, for, <laughs> for the first, like, five years, That's right? That's a reveal later. Later. And he's also written as almost like, he's a very sitcom character in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Like a shut-in, he never goes out. He's just a, no- like, the wacky neighbor. That's all he is. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really do much, right? He's just like, hey, Jerry, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like this very quickly devolves into 
an insane person. Yes, like, it does. It yeah, does. Like, You're right. Like it's, it does not take long. No, it doesn't take long at all. Uh, some people that auditioned would be uh, Larry Hankin. You might know him as uh, Mr. Heckles on Friends or as the guy that plays Kramer in the Seinfeld pilot. I am building levels <laughs> with steps completely carpeted. You know who else auditioned? Who? Tony Shaloub. Adrian really? Monk. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Tony Shalhoub. You know, the hair, Joe. He, they, very uh, similar, like, face and hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> could have pulled it off. That could have worked. But instead, it was Michael Richards. He was born in 1949, so he was older than Jerry Seinfeld, uh, born in L.A. Interestingly enough, knew Larry David because he worked on Fridays. He was a cast member. There you go. He's part of that Andy Kaufman skit that I was referencing earlier. He also had bit parts on TV, uh, Miami Vice, mm -hmm. St. Elsewhere, Cheers. You think about this the next time you shoot your mouth off in some bar. He also did this like fitness instructor character known as Dick Williams, and he would go on the Jay Leno like Monday Night Tonight Show thing, and like it was weird. Would you please welcome Hollywood's top fitness trainer, Dick Williams, ladies and gentlemen, Dick Williams. So he won the role of Kramer, and of course we need one more person. We need a female for this pilot. How about Claire the waitress? What? Yes, yes. So Claire the waitress. Yeah. So, Jerry and... I immediately uh, don't like this. That's an idea. <laughs> Jerry and George frequent a coffee shop known as Pete's Luncheonette in the pilot. And the waitress there is supposed to be the, the female lead. She was played by an actress known as Lee Garlington, who was a character actress on a ton of shows. Hill Street Blues, Matlock, mm -hmm. L.A. Law, Family Ties, Roseanne later, Who's the Boss, Coach, Blossom. So basically, like, everything. Golden Girls, Home Improvement. All the main ones. Friends. Yeah. Yes, like yep. all of them, right? And that is what we had. So the pilot that we're talking about. This was taped April 27th, 1989. I think I've seen this once and I didn't like it. It's very different. Yeah. It is different. It was taped at Renmar Studios, which uh, at the time was known as Desilu Kawanga. What? I get the Desilu, but Kawanga? Kawanga, don't worry. And this is where uh, Dick Van Dyke show was taped. Hmm. Very Carl Reiner, speaking of him. And I Love Lucy was taped for the end of its 53 to 57. But anyway, the pilot aired. This is important, folks. July 5th, 1989 at 9.30 p.m. as a burned off pilot, meaning NBC already knew they weren't picking it up. So they're like, well, we made this thing. Let's run it as a one-off. Okay. He's a stand-up guy in an outrageous sitcom special. The Seinfeld Chronicles after Night Court next Wednesday. So here's the deal. Sometimes with pilots, you run them and then you let the audience determine. Right. Sometimes with pilots, the executives determine. They determined we don't want this show. <laughs> so they're like, well, we filmed it. Let's burn it off very, in the summer. Very Seinfeld. Right. <laughs> just that Just that is very much how this show seems right. like it would go. Just like, eh. Now, I'm going to show you guys a couple of weird things about this pilot. Maybe you've never heard it before. The theme song is not what you would remember. Here yeah. is the original Seinfeld theme. Do you know what this is all about? Do you know why we're here? I hate this. To be this. out. This is out. And out is one of the single most right, the Seinfeld of Chronicles. Yes, See, people talk about we should go out. This is what they're talking like about. Friday night videos. This Very 80s, right? Yeah. Cuz this is 89. Ugh. Now, I, I want to mention when they reran this in syndication, they thankfully did a very <laughs> good job at changing it to as much of a Seinfeld-esque intro as they could. Check this out. This is all about, do you know why we're here? Yeah. To be out. This is out. Well, probably because they had the, one of the single they probably had the raw masters. So they could just, yeah. like, People insert different music. They, they pulled the music off. Talking about. This whole thing, we're all out now. No one is home. And they took the Seinfeld Chronicles thing out as yeah. well. It's, it's much better. So, the first scene is actually a callback in the finale, which we'll get to at one point. Mm -hmm. So, we go to Pete's Luncheonette, which is also featured, I, I want to say, in like one of the Muppet movies or something. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but here we go. Here's the first conversation ever heard I on like Seinfeld. I like how close to the same thing it is at the same time. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're in it, a coffee shop. It, 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 it's even on a corner and everything. Like, it's... <laughs> It's just, right. a, it's just a different one. It's just a different one. So here's the first ever conversation in the first ever scene of Seinfeld. See, now to me, that button's in the worst possible spot. 
The second button literally makes or breaks the shirt. Look at it. It's too high. It's There's a no man's Claire thing. You look like you live with your mother. Are you through? <laughs> you do, of course, try on when you buy. Yes, it was purple. I liked it. I don't actually recall considering the button. This is you similar to, like, any Seinfeld conversation, uh, no, though. No, That's what I was going to say. So... This is very weird if you consider 1989 in terms of sitcoms. Right. To open a pilot with a meaningless conversation about a button on a shirt. See, the thing is, in retrospect, is it's like it's very much what this show is. It is. And what's weird is you can stick that pilot and younger people who don't even know it's a pilot. They might think it's just an episode of Seinfeld. Right. They're not going to even notice. I agree with you. They might you. be like, who's this weird lady talking to them? <laughs> right. Like, But like, other than that. Claire, you're a woman, right? What gave it away, George? Um, I'd like to ask you, ask you to analyze a hypothetical phone call, you know, from a female point oh, of view. come on now. What are you asking her? Now, how is she going to know? So as far as the reception, even though they passed on it, the NBC executives generally liked it, but you know who didn't? Brandon Tartikoff. <laughs> Makes sense. And he's the one that mattered. And then it was sent to 400 households as a test audience, and they all hated it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because they're like, what is this fucking show? Like, yeah. What are they talking about? Yeah. What are they doing? Uh -huh. You know what I mean? No, it's okay now. That, that girl's not coming. Uh, I, I misread the whole thing. You want me to talk to her? <laughs> As we said, it was known as the Seinfeld Chronicles. That's now, a horrible name, but can we just say the Seinfeld? Was. Who thought that was? That feels like the executives like interjected. You think so? After the fact, it I does not make any sense. I don't think it's that good either. Now, critically, what's interesting is critically because remember it aired on television. It had actually a pretty positive reaction for the most part, but it didn't I can totally see critics being like the only people who get yeah. what's going on here. It didn't matter because it was already passed by NBC, but Ken Tucker, a critic, said this. NBC is making a mistake if it mm. doesn't pick up the Seinfeld Chronicles as a mid-season replacement. It's bound to be superior to most of what the network has planned for well, the fall. Well, okay, so here's the deal, right? We talked about this on the must-see TV. Yep. How NBC was like kind of in trouble, yep. like constantly throughout the eighty. Well, we they had recovered in the eighties, but they still were they were coming teetering. out of it, right? They were still coming out of their shittiness, especially by eighty nine. Yeah. yeah. Well, Rick Ludwin, remember late night and specials? He championed the show, and he told NBC, "I'm going to cancel a two hour Bob Hope special and use those two hours." to order four episodes of Seinfeld for the following season. It's weird that Bob Hope was still doing specials by 89. <laughs> Can we just say that? It, wasn't he alive until like the 2000s or something? I understand that, wasn't but this is though? the guy doing who did like Vietnam USO specials like and stuff. Probably like that, Korea That's also. how long he's been around. Didn't he do World War II specials, uh, Quinn? Yes! <laughs> yes! That's what I mean. It's like he goes, he, he goes back before TV. What are we still doing airing this crap, right? Did anyone watch Bob Hope specials well, in the I 90s? Mean, okay, it's still... Here's the thing. is The early 90s, the World War II generation was still They were. Around. They were kicking. My grandfather was. Yeah, and they weren't even crazy old yet. It wasn't like they were like... They're like in their 60s. Yeah, but they, they still watch TV. <laughs> you know, so I, I guess I understand. But also, like, Bob Hope in primetime? Like, not... On the weekend, where like old people are watching them at the retirement home after like, Matlock like or on, whatever, like Sunday morning or something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Sunday morning, wow. Yeah, but say, you know what I mean. Like I Sunday, do. like afternoon. Yeah, like yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> non football season. Non football. So Rick Ludwin really believed in this show. Rick Ludwin said, "I'll I'll give up some of my specials budget here," and four episodes were ordered, which I need to make mention is the. Smallest order uh, in sitcom history. <laughs> four. <laughs> We're doing four. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I think I'll hold on to my apartment then. Now, one big change needed to happen. They needed a new female lead. Please. So, so Lee Garlington, Claire the Waitress, she had run afoul of Larry David anyway by rewriting her lines, which if we know anything about Larry David... Don't, don't mess with my stuff. Don't but, mess with my script. Yeah. So 
they came up, Jerry and Larry did, with this idea to have the female lead be a platonic former ex-girlfriend of Jerry. Yeah. Who, by the way, we didn't mention this because I know you guys know it. Jerry Seinfeld plays a character known as Jerry Seinfeld. Yes. And he's a stand-up comedian. Right. That's he's, the idea. He's himself in quotes, I would yeah, say. Yeah, in quotes. Well, yeah, like, but but the whole, yeah, this this Elaine character, right? Yeah. As she would be called. Yep, Elaine Bennis. She, her background story is that her and Jerry, they, they would very overtly say, we've had sex before, yeah, basically. Yeah. Like, like, but they would blurt it out because it's the 90s and we got to say sex, right? <laughs> like, but, but also it was like sometimes on again, off again. Like, briefly. Yeah. yeah. They dated for like, it's an unspecified period of time before right. the show. They don't, they, they never say how long they were right. together. But when the show starts proper after the pilot, it's supposed to be like recently that they're not dating anymore. But Elaine is uh, obviously on the show the entire duration, so she is. She has a little bit of a backstory that is developed throughout the course of the series. She's from uh, Towson, Maryland, a suburb of Baltimore. She had moved to New York in 1986, and when the show starts, and for the first several years, she is a manuscript reader for Pendant Publishing. <laughs> She's like a real job, you know. I love the company names that they'll Pendant, Pendant Publishing. Pendant. And you know who else auditioned for this one? Rosie O'Donnell. I could see that because she's raucous. She could like go yep. with the. It's supposed one to be one girl with the boys, yeah. right? So like Rosie O'Donnell kind of works it in, that, in that sense. Megan Mullally, who obviously was on Will and Grace right. most famously. Again, another could hang with the boys yeah. kind of actress. And Patricia Heaton, who was Deborah Barone on Everybody Loves Raymond. This is so weird because the three, those three types of women and how they present themselves and whatnot. They could Julia Louis Dreyfus, up. who eventually got the role. Julia right? Louis Dreyfus, yes. Louis, Julia, Julia Louis Dreyfus. She is very feminine in comparison. Yes. You know, at least how she always seems on its face. Like obviously, the Julia Louis Dreyfus is very. <laughs> one of the boys when you she's awesome. when you understand like her humor and stuff. Yeah, but. On her face, she she's very pretty. Oh yeah, right? you know what I mean. She doesn't seem like she should be in this crowd of losers. In fact, I feel sometimes the show plays off that later like, on. What yeah. is she doing with these yeah, people? Later on, like, they do. So Julia Louis Dreyfus was born in 1961 from New York, and uh, the daughter of a French billionaire known as Gerard Louis Dreyfus. She had a background in improv, Second City, of course, because everyone does and yeah. <laughs> when they're in improv. And at the age of 21 in 1982, she would join the cast of Saturday Night Live. Now, again, Saturday Night Live was not good in this period of time. Very, she's very notoriously very associated with the crappy SNL. The crap era, yeah. Like, it, like it's always noted that this cast sucked, but they had Julie Louis-Dreyfus. <laughs> it's like, true. That, that's, they always say that. <laughs> like, real. in any, like, documentary about this, this sucked, but she was here. Okay, are you satisfied? Here I am. Well, we're all together again for a nice Thanksgiving. Oh, I'm not eating. What do you mean you're not eating? I don't eat meat anymore, Dad. Um, I just could never really eat a living thing. Well, my dear, we're not asking you to eat a living thing. We're asking you to eat a dead thing. She is very funny and very talented. And she was on SNL for three years until 85. She didn't get to do much, but you know who she met while she was there? Larry David. Of course, yeah. And her future husband, Brad Hall. But anyway, after SNL, she had some bit parts in films. She was in Hannah and Her Sisters, and maybe most of you know this. I've seen her in Hannah and yeah. Her Sisters. She's also on Christmas Vacation. Yes. Remember as the neighbor? Yeah, the she's yuppie the like, couple. evil, <laughs> yeah. yuppie neighbor. And why is the carpet all wet, Todd? I don't know, Margo. So, we got a four-season episode coming up. Uh, hi. Well, I, because... Actually, I think that uh, I, well because you meant four episode uh, uh, season. You um, you said it the the other way uh, around. Let's see how this goes, and we will obviously do that on the other side of this break. We're going to talk about the first three seasons of Seinfeld, run down some of the episodes, some of the moments that happened there in this Seinfeld series about nothing that we're doing, uh, and that will be coming up when more Ask to Wash Memories returns.
today's hottest comedian. And those blank lines. I hate it when there's nobody on the line at all. And you still have to go through the little maze. Could you get a little piece of cheese for me? I'm almost at the front. I'd like a reward. The first of NBC's summer hits. How much could you possibly have in there? I know a guy who took his vacation on his change. Yeah, where'd he go? To an arcade? Look, I can give you these and you can roll them yourself. You want me to roll 6,000 of these? What, should I quit my job? It's Seinfeld, premiering Thursday right after Cheers on NBC. Hey, I hope you're eating potato chips because i got to show you something. These Delta Gold brand potato chips are so fine you can even see how good they taste. Check this out. Get out one of the chips you're eating and bring it up here. Now, I'll take out one of my chips, and you put your chip next to mine. You see how golden and light-colored these Delta Gold chips are? Well, that's exactly how they taste. Delta Gold chips absolutely sparkle with flavor. And the final proof is you take one out, you pop it into your mouth, and the bing You are golden. New Delta Gold brand. You can see how good they taste. Everybody's getting into shape these days. Hi, Dave. Riding that extra mile. Pumping a little more iron. Doing whatever it takes to stay fit. And Wendy's can help. Introducing Wendy's new grilled chicken filet made from a whole breast of chicken, lettuce, and tomato and topped with honey mustard on a toasted bun. It's a delicious way to stay in shape. You know what I like about exercise? What? I like it when it's over. Wendy's new grilled chicken filet. Grilled to be great. And now we return to more acid-washed memories. Welcome back. You came Howdy. back. We're back, baby. I'm here with Art Vandalay. My yeah. name's Joe Morata. <laughs> and uh, we thank you guys for being with us here for Why episode 64. Why can't I be J- JP Pennypacker? You can be. Yeah. Cal Varnson, maybe. Yeah. Thank you guys for uh, for joining us here. Check out our archives if you want non-Seinfeld-related chatter. And obviously follow us on Twitter at AWM Podcast. Join our Facebook group and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. That's it for the particulars, but Michael Quinn... It's about damn time we talk about Seinfeld in yeah, full, time, right? Time, this is what I've been looking forward to in this episode. Because the background of this show, I feel like a lot of people know. You know, like, they probably do. This is a this was like you know because this show was so heralded. There was a lot of heralding. To, they, even the show itself talks about it. it's <laughs> it's it's the Inception, making of. Yeah, you know, I, I've been wanting to get into the episodes. You know, well, we are going to because as we mentioned, NBC ordered a whopper of a season. Four. Right. Four episodes. And we talked about why and the circumstances and yep. how it wasn't really ever supposed to get made in the first place. It really wasn't. Rick Ludwin really wanted them to do it. So right. season one, and I'm using in season quotes. lightly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this aired May 31st to June 21st, 1990, just four weeks in a row after Cheers reruns on Thursday. So Cheers had reruns at nine o'clock. At 9.30 was four new episodes of Seinfeld. We're in the prime Rebecca years here. We have Robin Colcord years, yeah. yes. There is no rank. It did not rank in the Nielsen's. It had four episodes, okay? Mm-hmm. All the episodes were directed by a guy that would direct the first four, five seasons, Tom Sharonis. And this is where we get, Quinn, the classic synth bass theme by Jonathan Wolf. Do you like the Seinfeld theme? I never thought it was like a good theme. See, I did. But here's the thing: is like I always felt it wasn't. I'm a, a big th- TV theme. Yes, you are fan, right? Yes, you are. I always felt that like it was the weakest, but not. It didn't mean that it was bad. It meant that this show doesn't need a theme. Does that make sense? It's not really about like being like a sitcom with a theme, and like it's just it's not what it is. And I always liked how subdued this was. That's like, what I'm saying too. But I think. The the idea that people like you know I, I see YouTube videos where like the best themes of the '90s are and I'm like this isn't the best get out but of here it's like it's notable not even, yeah it's but it's not even close to like the best at all it, in fact it's intentionally not trying to be the best it's supposed to be minimalist you yeah know what I mean just a few synth bass like I notes. feel like you're insulting it by by keep putting it up there in like even the top ten or anything really? yeah like okay. it, it should not be that okay fair enough. I like it because it is so minimal. It's just yeah. bass notes. And the, the theme of Seinfeld for the first seven seasons, the opening was Jerry doing a little stand-up bit yeah. under these improv bass notes. Yeah. Have you ever noticed if a guy's out in his driveway working on something with tools, how all the other men in the neighborhood are magnetically drawn to this activity? <laughs> they just come wandering out of the house like zombies. <laughs> in season one, even from the very beginning... We have no more Pete's Luncheonette. Instead, where Jerry and George and others eat is Monk's Cafe. 
It is the exterior that is pretty much iconically known um, is Tom's Restaurant, right? Which is a real place in New York. Uh, so Monks will become a fixture for all nine seasons. Mm-hmm. It's there the entire run. It's also the first um, mention in season one of Art Vandalay. It's when Jerry and George in the stakeout, uh, you know, where Jerry is trying to find out where he staked out a building where a lady works that mm-hmm. he met at the party. And he and George are coming up with scenarios, and they come up with Art Vandalay. I forgot who I am. Who am I? <laughs> Where are you? We're having lunch with Art Corvalet. Vandalay. Corvalet. Let me be the architect. I can do it. I can do it. Initially, Art Corvalet, but it's, cra- it's crazy that's like in the first season. Like yeah. the, the, the proper first season, yeah, if you want to really even is. call it that. We also meet Helen and Morty Seinfeld, Jerry's parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, Who aren't the same actors, right? Uh, well, Helen is Liz, Liz Shapiro. Okay. Liz, it's the dad? Liz Sheridan, yes. Morty is played by a fellow known as Phil Bruns. Yeah, this was this was always very off-putting to me. It's upsetting because he's... Barney that's Ma- not Morty. No, like, Barney Martin came in and did Morty after yeah, this, right? That's not Morty at all. He's like way too nice and calm. He's like, yeah. hey, why well, just go to her building right. or whatever. You know, go to where she the works. Mom, the mom always made sense, though. Helen's even from, amazing. He, even from the beginning. She's so good. Yeah. Liz Sheridan is so she's good. She's the typical, like, a little too worried yep. mother. Like, she, like which kind of just the way Jerry is, she fits to a T. Yep. Like, she's exactly how I would envision Jerry's mother. Exactly. So who are you looking for, Sophia Loren? That's got nothing to do with it. What about Lonnie Anderson? <laughs> Where do you get Lonnie Anderson? Why, what's wrong with Lonnie Anderson? I like a lame more than Lonnie Anderson. What are you two talking about? One of the big things, there's four episodes here. They are The Stakeout, which is the one we were talking about. The Robbery, which was written by a guy named Matt Goldman. The rest are written by Jerry and Larry together. The Robbery is one where Jerry leaves. He, Elaine watches the apartment, but like someone robs stuff because mm-hmm. Kramer left the door open, right? Right. There's also male unbonding where Jerry tries to like break up with an annoying friend. A lot of these episodes, you know, the first season's whatever, but a lot of them are like very typical for the show. Yeah, they still are. There might even be a lot of like sub scenarios, not even like the main scenarios yes. like, anymore. And there's also the stock tip. The thing about the first four episodes here is they are very, very low key and slow paced. Mm hmm. If you think of Seinfeld folks in your mind, you think of these rapid scene changes. Here's right. George at Yankee Stadium. Here's Elaine with Putty. Yeah. Here's Jerry doing this. Here's this. Boom, 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 yeah. boom. These first, really the first few years, but especially these first four, mm-hmm. it's just like a lot of wasted motion, a lot of stretching out. I feel like they're writing it like it's Cheers or something, like that it's supposed to be like really smart and like. They are out know, like and it's like, smart. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Like that's how that was a that, that was very popular when this show started with how Cheers was because Cheers was written in a very smart way. Like yeah, that. this is very like very leisure. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I know. I don't want to go. He was really crying. I had to give him a tissue. In fact, let me call his machine now, and I'll, I'll just make up some excuse why I can't go to the game either. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. As long as you're gonna lie to the guy. Why don't you tell him that you lost both of the tickets? Then we can go. George, the man wept. The other thing, too, is the characterization. Elaine is pretty much Elaine. And early Elaine especially is like, I love her because she's nice. Yeah, I mean. She's smart. She's funny. From the get-go, I felt like Elaine was pinned as, like, the sane one in the group. Yes. I mean, Jerry. Well, Jerry is. Yeah, but Jerry is, but, like, Elaine more so even than Jerry. Come on, let's go do something. I don't want to just sit around here. Okay. Want to go get something to eat? Where do you want to go? I don't care. I'm not hungry. (laughs) We go to one of those uh, cappuccino places. They let you just sit there. What are we going to do there? Talk? We can talk. I'll go if I don't have to talk. George, in the first few here, is supposed to be a lot more intelligent. Yeah. He's not unsuccessful. He's a real estate agent. Which, okay, in the first, I hate it. Like, you know, I, I, it's I, anti love George. The, I love the, like, when they settle into, like, after George loses his job in the later seasons, and, like, that's, like... Loser George? 
quintessential George when he like comes to the conclusion that he's a loser and he just like embraces it. Like he's just he's just ludicrous. Well, because Jason Alexander plays it so well, doesn't yeah, he? He, yeah. he does. Yeah. He plays that character well. When that floss came flying out of my pocket. <laughs> floss? When? We were in the lobby during the intermission of the play. I was buying on one of those containers of orange drink for five dollars. I reach into my pocket to pay for it. I look down. There's this piece of green floss hanging from my fingers. Ah, mint. The other thing too is that for the first bit including these four, Kramer, Michael Richards portrays Kramer as stupid. Yes. And get this. Now, I just got off the elevator with him, and I tested him. I tested him. like I, This is what I said to him. I, like I was like this. I went, oh, by the way, I know about the stuff. You know, very casual, right. so he's going to take me into his confidence. So what did he say? What stuff? Oh. <laughs> Even the way Michael plays it, Michael Richards... In the beginning, he plays it very much like, what was the, what's the guy, uh, Christopher Lloyd on Taxi, what, what's his name, Reverend Jim, whatever, Yeah, I don't right? remember, Reverend I, Jim. I know who you're talking about, though. Can't think of the last name off the top of my head, I'm sorry. He plays him more like oafish and dumb. Yeah. But later, Kramer's like ahead of everybody, like Kramer thinks he's smarter than everyone. And then he got the idea that he should play it, that everyone else is dumber than him. And that was the key to it. Another thing and this is minor, but I wanted to mention it, is Jerry's apartment, only in this first season and the pilot, is a studio apartment. Hmm. His bedroom is the living room with a pullout. Right. This is completely abandoned later, and he has his own separate bedroom. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, there's like a attached room or whatever. Yeah. So there's four episodes. None of them are among my favorites. I'm not no. going to lie. <laughs> like, They're just there. The stakeout's probably my favorite one. However, this show did well enough these four episodes that NBC ordered 13 more. Now a standard sitcom is 22, 24. We're, we're working towards we're getting there. We're, <laughs> we're working towards getting a real season. A season two was a mid season replacement, right? It, Which is what the critics wanted, right? They say, let them be a mid season replacement and see how they do. Well, they were from January to June of 91. We have 13 episodes, although one of them aired in season three. We'll talk about it later. So the first four episodes of this season aired Wednesdays at 9.30, not even behind Cheers. However, the rest of the season aired Thursdays after Cheers. Try to get it an audience, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, so somebody, had, something had turned at that point if they're putting it behind Cheers to try to garner something, I right? think so, because it was critic. the critics liked it and the yeah. audience was responding well enough to this weird-ass show. Yeah, for all we know, internally, it might have become a prestige project. I think so. Right? I really do think it was, yes. They figure that we've invested this in Jerry Seinfeld. He's obviously got a future somewhere. Larry yeah. David is talented. Which the cast is good. Let's go for it, right? So season two, hey, at least it ranked in the Nielsen's number 46. I mean, for a show that nobody really wanted, that's right? pretty decent. Right. <laughs> like, hey, fuck it. We're getting there. Filming move from Quinn's favorite studio, Desilu Coenga, yeah. to CBS Studio Center. That's, that, where that's like the to. main one. Yep. Two new writers, so it was just Jerry and Larry for the most part. We get the first episode from Peter Melman, who would go on to write a long time for Seinfeld, and Larry Charles, who was kind of like their second in command. For the second Larry. Yeah, the other Larry. He also, uh, most famously, I guess, directed Borat. Very nice. Sorry. Uh, this suit is not black. No, no, not has to be the end. Okay. Okay. This suit is black nut. In this season, in the episode known as the Pony Remark, F Barney Martin replaces Phil Bruns as Morty Seinfeld, so that's Thank sad goodness. now. Yeah, yeah, so much better. She made me fly all the way from Florida for this, and then she criticizes my jacket. <laughs> we also meet in that same episode, the Pony Remark, for the first time, Uncle Leo. Oh. Uh, Jerry, you're listening to this. <laughs> yeah, Uncle Leo. So... So now the Parks Commissioner is recommending Jeffrey for a citation. Right, for the uh, reducing of the pond scum? Oh, for the walking tours. Uncle Len Leo. Lesser. Uncle Leo is something else. <laughs> um, he is a very funny character. First of all, like when I think of Uncle Lee, Uncle yeah. Leo is like one of the first things that comes to mind. He's eccentric and weird, and he does things like always talk about his son and like Jeffrey, like, your Jeff cousin, always Jeffrey, and yep. he's also like 
on one hand, an ally of Jerry's, but on the other hand, a nemesis. Like, well, it's always like there's some kind of favor either Leo's yeah, getting from Jerry or like Jerry's getting, getting from Leo. It always goes too far. Like, Jerry wants to have as minimal reactions with this man as possible. Right. And, like, uh, Uncle Leo's, like, always, like, hanging on. Yeah, he's like, Jerry! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It touches on that, like, idea that you do a favor for a family member and then suddenly they like won't like like leave you alone yes. and like like in real life you would kind of just go along with it or whatever yeah. right and you wouldn't really even think about it but this like touches on the like it really touches on the nerve of like how it can be like annoying Correct. Like, to the point of like Jerry's like an exaggerated like he's just bitching to like George about Leo and stuff. The joke is is that no one really likes Leo. Right. It's it's Helen's brother by the way. It's his mom's brother. Right. But no one like Morty doesn't like him. Nobody yeah. really likes Uncle Leo. He knows the whole history of the park. For two hours he's talking and answering questions. But you want to know something? Whenever he has a problem with one of these high-powered big shots from the Parks Department, you know who he calls? Mickey Mantle? <laughs> one of my favorite episodes from season two, which is a much better season than the four episodes of season one, mm-hmm. is the jacket. This is where Jerry buys a brand new suede jacket, but he's got to meet Elaine's dad, Alton Bennis, who is a... a Wasn't he like a drill instructor? A writer. Yeah, a writer. A writer? writer? You're okay. thinking of Home Improvement with... Oh, right, right, Jill's right. dad. Yeah, it's sorry. very similar. Yeah. And he writes a book. That's why you're I thinking I just remember that. this guy's very stern, so I very. just I immediately think military. He's a, a author based on Richard Yates. Want a drink? Sure. What do you have? I'll have uh, cranberry juice with two limes. And uh, I have a club soda with no ice. <laughs> I'll have another scotch with plenty of ice. <laughs> you like ice? Huh? I say... Do you like ice? I like it. Don't you find that you get more without it? Alton Dennis is played by Lawrence Tierney, who is a psycho in real life. But anyway, this is where Jerry turns his jacket inside out, but it's got like a candy stripe, so the guy gets all pissed. <laughs> Alton gets all pissed. Yeah. So like, you're not going out with us like that. Yeah. And anyway, it's a great episode, and he's very funny in it. It's an awesome episode. I have to tell you, this guy scares me. The waiter was trembling. If she doesn't show up, we can't possibly have dinner with him alone. How are we going to get out of it? We'll say we're frightened and we have to go home. <laughs> yeah, that's good. He'd clunk our heads together like Mo. <laughs> there was um, a point in this season where Kramer started getting more Kramer-y. And it's, <laughs> and episode- it's the only way you can describe him, yeah. Kramer-y. Kramer-y. There is, can we just say, like... As Kramer's developing into Kramer, instead he, of the weird neighbor, yeah, he is like nothing I've ever seen before or since this show. Something that you would never find in another TV show. I agree with you. It's a very unique character. It's really hard to replicate him. He's <laughs> a lot of that. Again, think what you want of him personally. That's fine. But a lot of that, comedic wise, is Michael Richards. Yes, it is. I will say this. Kramer might be one of the funniest characters personally to me ever. He's very funny. I cannot ever get enough of him. Yeah. Like, in fact, the Kramer plots are always more intriguing to me in a Seinfeld yeah. episode because they're so off the wall. He really is good. Yeah. He really is a good sitcom character. As a kid, I loved him. I thought he was, like, the best thing on the show. I think he's a lot of people's favorite character. Mine is probably George. I love but- George, too. George is, like, my close number two, but <laughs> it's just that it's the kind of shit Kramer would come up with was just yeah. so bad bat shit that I, I I would just love it. And he's very funny. He's yeah. just a funny the things he says are funny. So he starts getting more Kramery in an episode called The Statue, which is where Jerry thinks his house cleaner has stolen stolen a statue that belonged to George or whatever. One way or another, Kramer acts like a, a cop, like yeah. a detective. Mm-hmm. And it's where you first see Kramer like, you know, doing a persona and yes. like on a mission. Yes. And not just and taking a, it way too seriously. Yeah, way too seriously, way too involved. Burglary, grand larceny, possession of stolen goods, and, and murder! Murder! So, keep them spread. You just make love to that wall, pervert. <laughs> Also, uh, in season two is the first mention, and it's just really a mention, of a character known as Newman. Mm-hmm. And you hear uh, the voice of Newman off screen. 
In the original airing, it was Larry David. It would be redubbed by somebody who we will get to next season. Kramer! <gasps> That's Newman. <laughs> I'm on the road! In season two, George quits his real estate job. <laughs> then he tries to go back, and it doesn't work. I like sports. I could do something in sports. <laughs> Uh huh. In what capacity? You know, like the general manager of a baseball team. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that can be tough to get. Well, it doesn't even have to be the general manager. Maybe I could be like an announcer, like a color man. You know how I always make those interesting comments during the game? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you make good comments. So what about that? Well, you know, they tend to give those jobs to ex-ball players and people that are, you know, in broadcasting. <laughs> well, that's really not fair. I know. Now, this is based on something that really happened to Larry David, where he quit SNL. Right. But he went back and they, like, let him. Oh, okay. But, but in George's case, they don't. He doesn't. So now George is unemployed. A great episode here, sometimes swept under the rug when talking about great Seinfeld episodes, is uh, one known as The Deal. This is where Jerry and Elaine work out, basically, even though this term didn't exist yet, a friends with benefits deal where yes. they try to have sex without a relationship. I actually have wondered, because this episode's so early and Seinfeld was starting to become in the zeitgeist, was... The friends with benefits concept weirdly like I'm sure they, I, I I'm sure no I, I'm not saying it didn't exist please I'm saying it was like weirdly like not coined but like popularized in po in, in pop culture I mean maybe I mean no because I don't remember hearing about friends with benefits in pop culture specifically before this there weren't like sitcoms about it if right. that's what you mean like I, I mean if anything happened and we couldn't be friends the way we are now. That would really be bad. Devastating. Because this is very good. <laughs> and that would be good. That would be good, too. <laughs> the idea is to combine the this and the that. But this cannot be disturbed. This was due to NBC wanting, you know, something to do with Jerry and Elaine from a romantic standpoint. So this is what Jerry and Larry came up with. At the end of this episode is one of the few Seinfeld episodes where there's actually really serious. Yeah, yeah, there's like real emotion, like a real sitcom. So, uh, what are you guys gonna do today? Uh, this and that and the other. <laughs> Boy, I really liked the two of you much better when you weren't a couple. <laughs> They are ostensibly together at the end of the episode, but it's never like they never, ever revisit. That. Never follow up no, on it. Never. And the biggest standout, however, of season two is probably one of the first classic Seinfeld episodes, the Chinese restaurant. Yes, the Chinese restaurant. This is, you know, in retrospect and like in all the documentaries, it's like everyone's like the Chinese restaurant. This is the one that did it, right? It, and it led to the next, the, the parking garage. It's yeah. like the part two of this yeah, kind it's the of same like. Thing. It's the concept of that they're trying to get to something, right? Plan nine from outer space. Right. They're, tr or they're trying to do something else, but they end up, all we're seeing is like the run up to it and how like mundane and annoying. It's like and the dinner like, party yeah, one yeah. that yeah. we were talking about. But this is like the first, like it's very well written. All the dialogue God, in the Chinese good. restaurant is very good. Yeah. And this is like, to me, one of the templates for great Seinfeld episodes. I agree like, with you. That they and they wouldn't do stuff like this where the all four of them were waiting around for something like often, but when they did, they were in the Chinese restaurant template. Correct. And this is the first one. You ever notice how, how happy people are when they finally get a table? They feel so special because they've been chosen. It's enough to make you sick. Boy, you are really hungry. NBC hated it. They're like, what the fuck is this? Like nothing. It's in one set. But, the, you know, ironically for like, there's no the, new scenes. Ironically for these episodes to be considered the nothing, the, the episodes about nothing. Yeah. 
the whole point is that all these series of events occur right. while they're waiting. That's like, the thing. Th- th- a lot of things happen, actually. Everyone has a story. George is trying to call his girlfriend the right. whole time and get in touch with her because he needed to take a shit when they were having sex, so he left. This is real. Yeah. Jerry is trying to avoid this lady in a striped shirt that he doesn't know because he lied to his uncle about having mm-hmm. a stomach ache. Elaine is just really hungry. Kramer's not in it, by the way, because... Kramer didn't go out with them. That was the idea. Right. So he was written as like a shut-in, remember? Right. So Kramer's not in not this episode. Yet. Not yeah. yet. Because the, the, uh, we, Any other season, Don't worry, we'll get it. to the, the episode where all four of yeah. them are waiting for something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I can't have popcorn for dinner. <laughs> all right. But it's a great episode, and it, this was like, when people talk about how Seinfeld broke a mold... This was not something that was done. But isn't this considered the breakthrough episode? One like, of the in, yeah. in, in in like hindsight, because didn't this get like good ratings or, or it did. something? NBC like, did not want to put it on. They finally relented. Yeah, yeah. It's a cl- it's the first classic, right? It really is. Yeah, great episode. And the finale of season two, the bus boy. This is the first one where a later trope uh, developed, where different unconnected storylines would meet up at the end. Right. That could be like every episode. Yeah, it became every episode like a few years from now, right? Yeah. But the bus boy was the first one. So overall for season two, this is a much more developed show. It's snappier. It's funnier, but it is still low key. Right. It's still a low key show. It's not uber popular yet. But no. it's starting to get into the like amongst the the smarter circles of, right. of television watchers. Like it's becoming people are becoming aware of it. It's Correct. like it's like the show you ever see Seinfeld? Right. Like it's like one of those. That cool show Seinfeld. Yeah. Uh, nobody really knows it's very underground. It's like you gotta tell your friends about it because like they might cancel it if yeah. like people don't watch <laughs> it's it. Real, it's, though. it's like that. Like well, you're you're telling people because you don't want it to get canceled. It's true. Like, <laughs> but you're not even that far off, Quinn. Yeah. After an episode known as The Phone Message, uh, which was mid-season, NBC hated the ratings, so they put the show on a two-month hiatus. This is in season two. Once it came back, the ratings were good enough, so NBC said, you know what? Let's order an honest-to-God third season, like a real full season. (laughs) Thank you. So they did. 23 episodes for season three. Yes. Now, season three. Season three is... In now my we're opinion, getting somewhere. considered the one. This is when it becomes a show. We're not half stepping it. Yes. It's like this is like a real thing now that people watch and yes. it's like on a normal time slot right. and it's popular. This is September of 91 to May of 92 for the airtimes, just for the record. Wednesdays at 930 for the first half of the season. Then they bumped it up Wednesdays at nine for the second half of the season. They, they got the knew. nine. They knew. They got the nine. Uh, this ranked a little bit better than the season before, number 43 right. in the Nielsen's. Overall, like on average. Or on whatever. average, yep. Uh, there is a bunch of good episodes in this one. The highlight for me is an episode known as The Pen. This is where Jerry and Elaine go to Florida to stay with Morty and Helen. Oh, God, this. Yes. <laughs> Kramer and George are not in this one. It's the only time yeah. George is not in an episode. And Jack Clompus, we meet him for the first time. <laughs> Morty's what neighbor. A, what a name. Jack Clompus. Yeah. yeah. Sandy Barron plays him. He's got this. This is the pen that the astronauts use. Yes. Remember? <laughs> Take the pen. Oh, no. Go ahead. I couldn't. Come on, take the pen. I can't take Do it. Do me a personal favor. No, I'm not take comfortable. Take the pen. I cannot take it. Take the pen. Are you sure? I'm positive. Take the pen. <laughs> okay. Thank right. you very much. Right. Thank you. Gee, boy. Jack, what are you doing? Stop Jack, it. we should go. And this causes like a whole reaction within uh, the pines they lived in at the time. Not the bulk of this. No, that's later. And everyone's like, hey, you got a new pen. And everyone's all pissed that Jerry took the pen. Right. But Morty's like, he gave him the pen. Yeah. So where's the new pen? (laughs) What? The pen, the one Jack Clompus gave you. How did you know that? Blanche told me. Blanche? That's some good pen. Right's upside down. (laughs) 
what it is is a parody of how old people are once they're retired and they have yeah, nothing to do. They obsess over weird shit. Yes. Like, <laughs> like you think Jerry and George obsess over weird shit? Like, yeah. this is like. This is like next level. Yeah. Like, weird shit. Like, <laughs> it's a great episode. I it, love it, this it, episode. It's, it's good because it really does juxtapose, like. Hey, we think that that this group of people is fucking weird. Wait a second. Let's look at the older versions yeah. of them, basically. Let's look at their parents, yeah, basically. Yeah. And this is the one where Elaine is like, she hurts her back, so she's on muscle relaxer. She does the Stella yeah. and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stella. Stella. Uncle Leo's in this one. What a classic. Of course, Uncle Leo's in this he one. Yes. Uh there's the library with the library cop. Because Jerry's got an overdue book. Remember yes, that one? Yes, yes. There's the parking garage we talked so about. the parking garage. This is where we got to Excellent step in. episode. Okay, so the parking garage is considered the, like, again, in the Seinfeld lore of how good this show is, blah, blah, blah. People were like, the Chinese restaurant is the start, but the parking garage is, like, the over-the-top, like... even better. This is, this is the one, right? It's even like, better than the Chinese restaurant. This is the fucking restaurant. one, right? And essentially, they're just in a parking garage the whole time, and they can't find the car. We need a system. Well, it's got to be here. Why are they using so many colors? The numbers go up to 40. Maybe it's not on this level. <laughs> what? There's four different levels. Maybe we're on the wrong level. My mother loved this episode growing up. She Everyone would, she should. She would always talk about this episode. It's good. Like, even after years after it aired, it resonates with a lot of, I think especially adults at the time of like, there was always this concept that you could like lose your car in a, in a real. So this kind of like really leans into it. It's like, well, what would happen if that happened? Like, <laughs> right, right? Right. It's like, and you're with a group of people and you're looking around and what happens is a bunch of hijinks. Yeah. On the way to trying to find their car. You know right. what I mean? Like Elaine's got goldfish in a bag that right. she's trying to keep and alive. And isn't the bag, like, isn't the water going down <laughs> yeah, or something? It's all shitty. The, yeah, it keeps getting, like, worse as the episode's going. Kramer's carrying around an air conditioner the whole time. <laughs> it's like all this bullshit, right? Yeah. And what's great about this episode is not only do they <laughs> do <air> it, <laughs> <laughs> it is. And by the way, they're in like Paramus or something. Yeah, they're in, in Jersey, Jersey for because they went to the mall or yeah, something. Yeah, they went to a mall in Jersey. They can't find their car. When they do find it, this is the best part, and this is unscripted. They finally find the car. It's way too late for whatever they were supposed to be doing next. Yeah. It doesn't start, and that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Yeah, that's per- it's perfect ending. They've talked about that. Like, Kramer tries to start the car and it won't start. And that's, it wasn't supposed, they didn't write that. Yeah. It just, the car was it a piece happened. of shit. Yeah. yeah. But w- that episode is brilliant because they. It's considered like an old time. Yeah. Like, it, it's one of those episodes that I'm pretty sure they'd put in like some television history museum or something. They should be. And again, those of you that might not realize this, think about any other sitcom it on just, the air this was in 1991. Like nothing else that existed. It's so weird. Every, like, it's yes. so dumb. Because like, the thing is, Quinn, and you know this from watching TV, and so do yeah. I, every, and I mean every sitcom of the time in the early 90s. They were fall- formulaic. Yep. Followed a formula. Yeah. Here's your A plot. Here's your B plot. Back to the A. Let's resolve the A. Resolve the B. Happy music. It's over. There's no resolution in this. It's just no. all over the place. It's just st- it's just them like splitting up into groups and like looking right. for this thing, and then it doesn't. The car doesn't even work at the and end. And the plot of the episode is they're looking for a car. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's all that happens. There's yeah. no like the day doesn't change. Well, again, there's like weird subplots, right? There are, but like, it's all within this context. You yes. know what I mean? You know, I've been issued a public urination pass by the city because of my condition. <laughs> Fortunately, my little brother ran out of the house with it this morning. Another episode from the season is known as The Cafe. This is where there's a cafe across from Jerry's apartment owned by a guy named Babu. And we oh, meet Babu. Bob, we yes. meet Babu for the first time. Yep. And he's the one that does the finger. Yes. You're a very good man. Very, very, very good. Very, very, very bad. bad man. Very, very, we do see him later. You say Mac Pakistani. Babu but I've only Pakistani restaurant. But where are people? You see people? Show me people. There are no people. You know, I think I'll just take the check. You bad man. You very, very bad man. George stays unemployed pretty much this whole season. Which is a running joke. Yes. I'm unemployed. I live with my parents, that thing. Yeah. 
Now, an episode that was filmed during season two where George was in real estate airs in season three. I don't know why NBC didn't want it. It's called The Stranded. It's where um, they go to this party in Long Island. Ah, George yes. goes home with a girl. So Jerry mm-hmm. and Elaine are stuck there. But you know who's in it? Michael Chiklis, the commission yeah. himself. So this is the one with maybe the dingo ate your baby. <laughs> yes. Like the whole like. So what I love about this episode is it's such. It's very realistic, by the way. It's realistic, but it's also such a lampoon on like these weird, yuppie, like dinner party things. In Long Island, no yeah, less, like, right? Yeah, and it's. It's like Jerry and Elaine detest being here. They like, hate it. They're only they, there for George. They're yeah, they hate this shit, right? <laughs> yeah. And like they are just like rolling their eyes at everything. That's, that's where they going. have the signal, remember, yeah, where the yeah. guy's going on about the peanut. Yeah. And there's something again, and this is where like this are they dating? Are they not dating? Right. Thing. Like this is one of those episodes where it feels like Jerry and Elaine are weird, weirdly dating in this situation. Yeah, they yeah. are very close knit in this one, right? They're very cutesy with each other. They are, but they're not together. What a great episode, though! And yeah, Michael Chiklis is like yeah. the guy. I mean, the, again, the, the the dingo ate your baby is like <laughs> yeah. what this is known for, right? Maybe the dingo ate your and baby. And what that's all that's about is it's this lady being like, and my baby, this my, my fiance, fiance my, my, my baby, my, my, my fiance. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh my god! The, so yeah, that's another that whole thing about my fiance, my fiance. Instead, instead of fiance. Fiance, I've lost this, my fiance. This lady is like so like way overblowing that she has a fiance. Like it's like the biggest fucking deal, and she's pronouncing it this way, and she's just so fucking annoying. And Elaine gets like visibly annoyed about it. Remember? It's annoying. It is annoying. Like, <laughs> Do you see my fiance? He's upstairs. Are you going upstairs? Tell my fiance I'm looking for him. <laughs> I have lost my fiance. The poor baby. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the dingo ate your baby. (laughs) What? The dingo ate your baby. Again, this is why this is so perfect. This is stuff that you, that's going on in most people's heads when they're at something like right. this. They're like, why are you? Why, <laughs> why are you talking like this? Why are you annoying? <laughs> why are you brag like doing like the soft brag? I hate that. You know what I mean? Well, that's my fiance. Yeah, the, like <laughs> she's just bragging. That's like yeah, what that is. That's what it is, and it's annoying. It is annoying. Uh, there's an episode called The Red Dot where George buys a sweater, a cashmere sweater for Elaine. But it's got a red dot that the audience can't see, which I like. It's like a red dot. What? What red dot? What are you, what are you talking about? Jerry, come here for a second. Do, do you see anything here? Hmm? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. This was another one when I used to watch with my mom. I think we saw this one live. I love this episode. And I just remember, like, this one was a riot. We thought this was the fucking dot on the... T- and this is <laughs> and they can't return it, and it's like this whole thing. And there's so much going on in this one, because this is where George briefly gets a job at Pendant. Yeah. And meanwhile, Elaine is dating a guy that works there who was a recovering alcoholic. Dick. And yeah. they say Dick a real lot, and you know they know what they're doing. Right. Dick. Jerry accidentally gets him to fall off the wagon. Right. putting the wrong drink down. Because there's like some kind of like work party of some yep. kind. And George has sex with a cleaning woman on his desk. Mm-hmm. And this is where Richard Fancy debuts as Mr. Lipman, who would go on to be like very recurring. It's come to my attention that you and the cleaning woman have engaged in sexual intercourse on the desk in your office. Is that correct? <laughs> Who said that? She did. Was that wrong? (laughs) Should I not have done that? Mr. Lippman is like the first iteration of Elaine's boss, in quotes. Like, there's always an Elaine's boss character. there's a few more after him. Yes, and the most notable one is much later. But, like, still, like, I always like the concept of the Elaine's boss character because they're they're always a character in and of themselves. They're, like, really ridiculous people. Do you like Lippman? Lipman's like the most like subdued of <laughs> yeah, the Elaine is. bosses. Like, he is he, quirky, but he's he's subdued. He's not as ludicrous as some of the later as ones. Pitt and uh, Peterman. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're right. There's an episode called The Subway, which takes place, guess where? On the subway. There's an episode called The Pez Dispenser. Oh, uh, this is a funny one. <laughs> where Jerry puts a Pez Dispenser on Elaine's knee during a piano recital by a girl George is dating, mm-hmm. and Elaine like cracks up because of it, yep. and it leads to hijinks. 
But in this season is the on-screen debut of the character Newman, who lives in the building. Newman. It's an episode called The Suicide. Who won the role of Newman but a rotund, very funny yes. actor by the name of Wayne Knight? I have a carpet sweeper you can use. I don't want a carpet sweeper. They don't do anything. <laughs> it gets my rug clean. Here's the thing with Wayne Knight. Nobody calls him Wayne Knight. He's, he's Newman. He's This man will be Newman till the day he dies. He yep. could, he'll be, have gray hair. Yep. He could lose all the weight, and he would still be Newman. He's always Newman. He's just Newman. Newman is the most recurring character. Yes. He's in 80-something episodes. So the way Newman is done is that he's like, He's Kramer's, like, friend. He yes. might even be his, like, best friend. Like, that Jerry Besides is actually, Jerry, like, yeah. maybe... It almost feels like Jerry and Newman are competing for, like, the top who's Kramer's best <laughs> friend. Like, it's true. Like, Newman and Kramer share a bond of just, like... Some, they, schemes. They, they, schemes and being weird in general. They're like Lucy and Ethel. Right. They, they are. What's different about Newman as far as Jerry thinks Kramer's weird, I think Newman doesn't think Kramer's weird. Yeah, I he, think he doesn't I, worry about it. Yeah, like <laughs> Newman's like cool with this shit. Like, and Kramer's the only person that doesn't find Newman annoying. Right. Jerry clearly would go on and never like Newman. George doesn't. George and Elaine don't like him. Yeah, but the, I I feel like George and Elaine don't have too much of an issue with Newman. Well, it, Elaine hates Newman. Yeah, like, but George does. They, they George really is like interact. very indifferent to Newman. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's true. He doesn't see him as like a threat to his friendship with Jerry. Yeah, yeah. so he's like, eh, whatever. Well, because he's Jerry's like sworn enemy or whatever. Pretty much. Yeah, he'll be, obviously play a big part in the show as the seasons go on. Yeah. Probably the best episode, even though the parking garage is one of the most cleans. I don't even know if this is the best one, but yeah, I think it is. Elaine Pope and Larry Charles won an Emmy for this episode, known as the Fix Up. This is where Jerry fixes up his friend George with Elaine's friend, Cynthia, who is played by Maggie Wheeler. You would know from uh, Friends as Janice, probably most okay. most notably, yep. except she uses her normal, much better voice. Not inside. the Janice voice. No, thank God, no. Which the Janice voice is just a Fran Drescher, like, fake voice. That's literally, yeah, I think that's on purpose, yeah. right? At least you're not bitter. <laughs> Who says I'm not bitter? Aren't you too young to be bitter? No, you can be young and bitter. You're just maybe not as bitter as I'm going to be 10 years from now, but <laughs> I'm bitter. I think she also ad- auditioned for Elaine, by the way. Mm-hmm. But this episode is fantastic. This is where they get fixed up. It goes well. George had taken a condom from Kramer because Kramer's friend, Bob Sacamano, who we first hear about in this season. <sighs> Bob Sacamano. Do you know my friend Bob Sacamano? Oh, the guy from Jersey. Yeah, he just got a job at a condom factory, medicine. <laughs> now, Bob Sacamano, just a qu- quick question, because this this is one of those weird things in my head. Are you going to ask if we ever see him? Was Bob Sacramento ever no. seen ever? Never. Was there not not even like by accident nope. before they decided he wouldn't be seen? Never. Okay. This is one of those great episodes because the interplay comes from Jerry and Elaine deciding to fix the two of them up. And then each of them are pitching this to their respective person. So George is like, what about the cheek? She have a nice cheek. She have a, a pinkish hue, a rosy glow. And Jerry's like, a pinkish hue. I need a good cheek. I like a good cheek. <laughs> She's got a fine cheek. Is there a pinkish hue? <laughs> a pinkish hue? Yes, a, a, a rosy glow. There's a hue. <laughs> There's like an analytical discussion yeah. between George and Jerry about yeah. if he should pursue this. And this is where Elaine and, and Cynthia, <laughs> Elaine's like, he's stocky, he's fat. No, he's powerful. Like, yeah. all, it's great writing. Mm-hmm. What does he look like? <laughs> Pardon? What does he look like? Um, well, he's got a, a lot of character in his face. Um, he's short. Um, he's stocky. He's fat. Is that what you're saying? That he's fat? Powerful. He is so powerful. He can lift a hundred pounds right up over his head. It turns out that she misses her period. Everyone thinks it's due to the defective condom, but she gets her period. So it's like fine. It's fine. But a great episode. And another one, this is probably what most people know this season for, even if they don't realize what season a two-parter known as The Boyfriend, 
with a very special guest, Keith Hernandez. Yes. Excuse me. I don't want to disturb you. I'm Keith Hernandez, and I just want to tell you what a big fan I am. I love your comedy. And the Keith Hernandez incident or whatever, right? That is described in one of the only flashbacks in Seinfeld, which is just... It's just the JFK fun. parody. It's it's incredible. So it's it's shot like it's the Zapruder film, and it's all about this. I don't even remember specifically what happened. Like it's Newman just, and Kramer think that Keith Hernandez spit on them, right? But it turns out to be Roger McDowell, right? So they're misremembered. And Jerry does this whole recap, which is a send up of the movie JFK, which had just come out, and which fun- Newman is in, right. by the way, Wayne Knight. The spit then proceeds to ricochet. Off the temple, striking Newman between the third and the fourth rib. The spit then came off the rib, made a right turn, hitting Newman in the right wrist, causing him to drop his baseball cap. The spit then splashed off the wrist, pauses in midair, mind you, makes a left turn, and lands on Newman's left thigh. That is one magic loogie. Uh, but this is what we were talking about earlier about how Seinfeld would sometimes go above its audience. Right. Not everyone got that. You know that not everyone saw Oliver Stone's JFK. Which is a great movie, but back and to the left. Back and to the left. But they did it anyway because of the way it was delivered, it didn't matter if everyone saw I'll it. I'll say this, though. Back then, the, the movie JFK was big was enough. Big I remember yeah, yeah, people... Yeah giving a shit a lot about that movie. <laughs> but I saw the Seinfeld scene before I saw JFK. Me too. But, I still but thought I re- it was funny. But I remember the hype around it. Oh, yeah. I was too young to see it when right. it first came out, but I saw it later in the 90s, yep. and I was like, oh, I get it now. But Keith Hernandez is very well remembered from this, yes. th- this two-parter. Especially, this, gave, this gave a rub to Keith Hernandez in pop culture for a while. It did. Especially the line, I am Keith Hernandez, mm-hmm. <laughs> when he's kissing Elaine. Yeah. Who does this guy think he is? <laughs> I'm Keith Hernandez. Brilliant two-parter here. Mm-hmm. I love it. And you want to be my latex salesman. <laughs> There's an episode known as The Limo where Jerry and George uh, take a limo that they know isn't theirs, and they they think they're on the way to MSG for a basketball game, and it turns out it's the limo of a, uh, a, a white supremacist, a neo-Nazi, Whoops. O'Brien. Remember that one? Yeah. There's also an episode known as The Parking Space, not Parking Garage, this is where George and Elena are coming on uh, on their way back from a flea market. George is trying to power all park. Some other guy tries to pull in head first. They get into like a stop gap. It turns out that the guy is coming up to Jerry's to watch a fight, unspecified fight. How many fights will you see that night? The whole episode is like mainly outside. Uh, by the way, one of the things about Seinfeld is they shot outside a lot for New York. Yeah. They had in the early years... It was like three storefronts that they used as New York, and they would just shoot it differently. Right. A little bit later, they got a much better outside. Yes. After season five, I think it was. The outside was very common in this show. Especially later, yeah. Yeah, there's like a lot of episodes outside. Outside. Like, and it, wherever the hell. It really does look like New York, the new set, the one they get later. It looks like a local neighborhood block. Like, it doesn't yeah. look like a busy block. It looks like the the kind of the residential blocks. If, you, if you've if you ever been to New York and maybe you're visiting a friend or, or yep. knows somebody who lives there, and then you walk and it's suddenly like just a regular neighbor. It's not like New York-y anymore. Yeah. They still got tall buildings, but it's not. That's same. where it is, though. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's supposed to be like the Upper West, I think, which yeah. is where Jerry lives. So Yeah. The finale of season three is an episode known as The Keys. This becomes an important part of a trilogy, which carries over to season four. The Keys is where Jerry's finally had enough of Kramer barging in at the wrong times. So Kramer leaves and goes to California. Right. (laughs) You get to see his misadventures. This has one of my favorite lines, period, in it. Which is what? So... Well, okay, can you describe how, like, Jerry and George go to, like, look for him or something? Yeah, although this is season four. Yeah, so. we can go because it's, like, connected. We'll, okay. we'll consider the beginning of four. There's a little preview. It, it has to, right? Because they're, they're like, an interconnected. It's one of the only ones. Yeah. So, in the beginning of season four, Jerry and George go out to L.A. as well because Jerry's going to be on The Tonight Show. Yeah, he takes George with him. And this is partially to find Kramer, no? Well, it's what they do while they're there. Yeah. They, they look for Kramer while they're there. At some point... Jerry oh. and George 
the cops like they they, don't they think know. Kramer's done some murders, right? And the cops are like, "Hey, we'll like bring you down. Can you like describe this guy? Like, yeah, we'll yeah. just give you a ride, right? It's not they're not arrested. No, right? they're just in the however, back of a cop car. However, they go, they go. <laughs> at some point, the cops are like, "Oh shit, we gotta like pull this guy over," and they like end up arresting him, right? And they some put, guy. They put him in the back, and it's it's, it's Clint Howard. It's Clint Howard, right? Clint Howard's brother. And they're in the car together, and like somehow. <laughs> How to tip a chambermaid. Chambermaid. And somehow Jerry says something about how, like, in Ann Landers, it says you should tip blah, blah, blah. And then Clint Howard just yells, Ann Landers sucks. Like, and it's just amazing. It, it is a good line. Yeah. Like, it really is. And then they start arguing, not about, like, he's a criminal. But like, also, they're not. They're they're debating like a very Seinfeld conversation with a criminal about how like tipping should work, yes. or it, it's like a whole. But Ann Lander sucks. Ann like Lander my, sucks. Yeah, it's just <laughs> one of my favorite things in that episode. I read it, Ann Landers. Oh, Ann Landers sucks. <laughs> Also, I think, isn't Kramer in Murphy Brown at the end of season three? I and, think, yeah. yeah. Where he's the, the, like, the whole, like, Kramer goes to L.A. Steven thing. Snell. He's, yeah. like, ending up in shows and stuff yeah. because he's, like, trying to, like, do whatever. Yep, yep. It's a parody of, like, the L.A. culture, and it's right. well done. And it, it does play off the fact that Kramer weirdly fits more into the weirdos in L.A. than he does in New York City. Yeah, like, he's not weird in L.A. Yeah, he's not the weird one. Right, right other anymore. people are weirder than him. Yeah, it's almost like Jerry and George are the weird once yeah. and Kramer's like normal. normal yeah yep so season three is where Seinfeld starts to speed up a bit but it still retains that like that slice of life nothingness you know mm-hmm. aspect of it and overall season three is a very funny season like Kramer is Kramer now George is the loser George that we all right. know he's like he's getting there I, th- I would say he's full loser at this point. Unemployed the whole season. Yeah, yeah okay. I think he's you're full right. Full loser. Because well, remember, even in the Keith Hernandez one, he's trying to like extend his unemployment and yeah, stuff the whole doing, time. It's all it's all just schemes. schemes. Yeah. And Elaine is still very nice and intelligent and also very lovable. Like yeah. Elaine is likable. Yes. Right. I lo- I love Elaine. Anyway, the characters in these first three seasons. The most of the conflict is because they're in like misunderstandings. Yes. And sometimes they're just dealing with like belligerent people. Right. If you really pay attention, they're not that bad so far. They're still trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. They have they have morals, they care. However, that's just the first 3 seasons. Four, five, and six, which will be coming up in several weeks from now when we do part two. Kind of the meat and potatoes yeah, of Seinfeld. Right. It, it, there, again, there's classic episodes in almost every season. In every era that we're going to talk yeah, about, even. It, I mean, we already, there was two with the with the garage and the, the, the Chinese, Chinese restaurant. restaurant yeah. But the fix-up and the boyfriend. Yeah, there's, the there's, a, there's a lot. Pony remark, right. pen. Yeah. There's some good ones. But the best is probably still yet to come because season four is where this show becomes... A cultural touchstone, a landmark, if you yeah. will, an icon. Yes, and there's like way too many good episodes. Almost all of them. Yeah, pretty much. There, I would yeah, say. I forget what season is. There's one where it's like I once was like I can't even believe like how many good episodes are like and there's like nothing bad. I think it's four. Yeah, folks, we're gonna find out. We appreciate you been with, being with us here though for this Seinfeld series that we're doing. We really, really hope that you like what we're doing here. Again, next week, don't worry, is something completely different. We're not right. doing this every week. We know that not everyone Kinda likes Kind of like Seinfeld. the Mario thing. Kind of like the Mario series, which yeah. we have to finish, by the way, yeah. Quinn. We still we'll, got one more game. We'll be doing that. But next week, something completely different, and we will be back for that. We want to thank you for being with us here. Go throw on some season one through three Seinfeld. Let us know your favorite episodes. Let us know what season you like. Season one. Season one. You mean, Who you mean season one plus two. Who watches that, by the yeah. way? But let us know, folks. Uh, your favorite Seinfeld era, episodes, character, whatever the case may be, do that on Twitter at AWM Podcast. Join our Facebook group and leave us a review. One way or another, though, Quinn and I are coming back next week, something different. And until that time, we appreciate you. So until next time, we'll see you for more. Ask to Wash Memories. See ya. Like what you heard? Be sure to leave a review and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We will see you next week.